This is not a transplant talk. I'm not a transplant nephrologist, so hopefully we'll provide a little bit of variety at the end of the day. Um, my talk is entitled Must Know Board Zebras. These are all cases that we've seen over the years at Brigham and Women's um, that I thought would be particularly instructive to bring up because they all have some points that would definitely, that or can definitely come up on the boards. Um, so I'm going to go through this as a case-based scenarios. Uh, I have nothing to disclose. So my first case is a 24-year-old Kuwaiti male, history of chronic kidney disease in the setting of reflux nephropathy from posterior urethral valves. Uh, he had multiple procedures um, over the course of his life. He required self-catheterization. His valves were actually first resected at 15 days of age, but he did require a, a revision at 17 days. Uh, I'm sorry, at 17 years. Um, he progressed to end-stage renal disease over time, and he was started on dialysis in Kuwait via an AV fistula. He came to the Brigham four months later for a transplant evaluation. His labs at the Brigham, after missing several dialysis sessions while he was traveling, showed a BUN of 90, a creatinine of 12.7, a bicarbonate of 12, a calcium level of 7.8, phosphate level of 6.6, .6, and a hemoglobin of 14. His medications included metoprolol, calcium carbonate, sevelomer hydrochloride, iron pills, darbipoetin, and nifedipine. And he dialyzed for three hours only, that was per his insistence, um, on a 180 dialyzer, potassium by scale, um, and regular blood flows, and a bicarb bath of 35 at the time. He had quite a bit of urine output per day, so really required minimal ultrafiltration on dialysis. So just looking here, his laboratory trends while on dialysis. So his creatinine certainly came down nicely, at least to the eight to nine range as his pre-dialysis creatinines and his BUNs down to the 50s and 60s once he was adequately dialyzed um, in terms of back on a regular schedule. Um, his bicarbonate remained quite high though. And um, I'll point out here that it remained, I'm sorry, it remained quite low and it remained low the entire time. Um, these were, I be, this was, I believe, either a Monday or a Tuesday, this being a Friday in terms of um, the timing. So this was another Monday or Tuesday. Um, and here we checked, because they were so low, we checked a post-dialysis bicarbonate as well that went up to 27. Um, his urine pH remained high. Um, so the question here is, what is the most likely reason for his persistent acidosis? Is it that he was inadequately dialyzed due to the refusal to dialyze longer than three and a quarter hours? We had talked him up to three and a quarter, but he wouldn't go more than that. Um, RTA due to reflux nephropathy. Dietary indiscretion is evidenced by the persistent hyperphosphatemia. The dialysis machine not adding bicarbonate correctly, or that sevelomer hydrochloride decreased bicarbonate concentration. Okay, I don't know if I did this right, but we will see. Um, okay, good. So yeah, it looks like most people felt either the an RTA or the sevelomer hydrochloride. Um, the um, oh, sorry. sorry, I'm just learning the technical stuff here. So um, in this case, we really did feel that it was um, more likely secondary to an RTA in this patient. Um, so just to address the other answers, um, if this were inadequate dialysis, his URR would probably be lower. His URR was 72 and 74 at the two different times. Um, and his other labs should have looked a little bit more like under dialysis. Um, dietary indiscretion certainly could be possible, but I think it would be hard to drive bicarbonate this low with diet alone. Um, if the dialysis machine were not adding bicarbonate correctly, so there are case reports of this happening, um, and you certainly can see it happen, but it would be expected to affect all patients on one specific machine. Um, this was going on over the course of a few weeks at the Brigham. Nobody else had specifically very low bicarb levels, and you wouldn't have expected his post-dialysis bicarb to trend up as high as 27, or 28 actually, um, if this were the case. 
um, civellamer hydrochloride, um, this can cause a mild acidosis at very high doses. So um, usually in studies that have looked at this, um, a bicarb of less than 15 was only seen in people with over 6,000 milligrams a day, and he was on 2,400 milligrams a day. So he wasn't on quite a high enough dose. Um, if you were to see that, although it could have been contributing a little bit, certainly, um, a fix for this would be to use civellamer carbonate, which is more commonly used nowadays anyway. Um, but maybe was not in Kuwait at the time. Um, so just to talk a little bit about reflux in the kidney, and I think this is something you probably see a little bit more commonly in non-dialysis patients for obvious reasons, but he still did make quite a bit of urine and seemed to be exhibiting this physiology. Um, reflux nephropathy develops in 30 to 60 percent of children with vesicourethral reflux, and the most common cause is these posterior urethral valves. It is more common in girls, but in boys that get it, it, be, it seems to be more severe than it is in the girls. Um, it causes scar formation in the kidneys um, and thinning of the renal parenchyma. Usually you see tubulo interstitial damage um, on a biopsy, tubular necrosis, and potentially a mononuclear infiltrate uh, interstitially uh, if you were to biopsy these folks. Um, so a distal RTA appears to precede the glomerular disease, probably because the tubular toxicity comes first, um, impairing distal acidification. Um, children who get this, since it is more common in children, tend to have hypokalemia with high urinary potassium losses as well, similar to most distal RTAs. Um, and it usually persists. So when the damage is done, the damage is done. So you can treat the obstruction, and these patients usually still have the RTAs, like this gentleman. Um, this is somewhat of a confusing slide, but I'll just point you to, so a study was done with a whole cohort of 24 patients who had posterior valve surgery. Um, of these patients, just to kind of focus down, so the ones with the positive anion gap were probably the RTAs, negative anion gap, likely acidotic from other causes. And um, just to show that it was likely a distal RTA, even after acidification of the urine, um, the urine pHs were not maximally acidified, whereas these patients with other physiologies did seem to have maximally acidified urine. So pointing again to the fact that this is more consistent with a distal RTA. Um, so in this patient, he continued to be acidotic on dialysis. And when he did eventually get his transplant, he actually had bilateral nephrectomies at the time of the transplant in order to try to control the acidosis since he was still making so much urine. Um, and um, it did help at least somewhat with the acidosis. Excuse me? Um, prior to the transplant? I know at the time he came to us, he had been on dialysis for about four months. So he still had pretty significantly good residual um, kidney function at the time. I actually don't recall how long it was before he got a transplant, but I believe it was a few months later. I think he had a donor who came with him. They got worked up and got him the transplant and the nephrectomies pretty quickly. So, and then he went back to Kuwait, so I don't have long-term follow-up on that. Um, so the next case I'm gonna present, uh, shifting gears completely, um, a 77-year-old male who was originally from the Azores, past medical history really of just bladder cancer. Um, eight months prior to admission to Brigham and Women's, he developed joint swelling and pain. He had an ESR of 59. Um, the doctors taking care of him at the time thought he might have had polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, they started prednisone presumptively, and his symptoms did improve. Um, he continued taking the prednisone, and then two months prior to admission, he developed anasarca and a rash, um, had five grams of proteinuria noted, and a serum albumin of, albumin of 1.8. Um, because of the presumed nephrotic syndrome, he had a CT to rule out a malignancy associated with this, and the CT revealed a pulmonary embolus and left renal vein thrombosis. Um, because of the finding of the PE and the renal vein thrombosis, no biopsy was done because they felt that they needed to anticoagulate him right away. Um, but his prednisone was increased to 60 daily to treat the membranous nephropathy. He was started on lisinopril and started on Coumadin. So at the time, and we got these records from his outside nephrologist, uh, this wasn't done with us, um, 
he had negative hepatitis serologies and anti-DNAs, normal complements, and SPEP was negative. His capital lambda ratio was normal. Um, so two months later, which is the time that he presented to the Brigham, he presented with severe diarrhea and sepsis. Um, he was quite sick, found to have esophageal candidiasis, E. coli bacteremia, and enterococcal bacteremia. He had pretty significant anasarca, one of the worst cases I've seen. Um, he was normotensive, otherwise unremarkable. He had al serum albumin level of 0 0.8 and a serum creatinine of 0 0.5. He was quite cachectic. Um, his triglycerides were 233, LDL of 88, so cholesterol not totally remarkable, but a little bit high on the triglycerides. His urinalysis showed three plus blood and protein. His protein to creatinine ratio was five grams. Um, a urine microscopy was done that showed hyaline casts, occasional dysmorphic red blood cells, and a renal ultrasound was pretty virtually unremarkable. Um, his serologies were pretty much negative other than a slightly low C3 and C4 at 68 and nine. Um, and prior to his subsequent death with overwhelming sepsis, he was also found to have disseminated strongyloides and aspergillosis. So the question here with this quite unfortunate man is, what is the most likely cause of his renal presentation? Is it post-streptococcal GN from an undiagnosed strep infection, AL amyloidosis, strongyloides associated membranous nephropathy, candidiasis in the kidney, or a renal vein thrombosis? All right, so um, if I can figure out how to get this up. Um, okay, so good. So I think a lot of people did catch this here that strongyloides associated membranous nephropathy um, was indeed what ended up causing this. Um, and the reason I brought this up actually had a lot to do with kind of um, an important point, I think, that we don't think about all that often in terms of immune suppression and uh, people in endemic areas. Um, so just to go through some of the other answers here. So post-streptococcal GN rarely presents as such a significant nephrotic syndrome. It's usually self-limited, um, has a rise in creatinine, hypertension. You can classically see a low C3 with a normal C4. This one had both. Um, AL amyloid would be, is less common without abnormal light chains in the blood, but certainly can be possible without it. Um, and can only be ruled out completely with a biopsy of a fat pattern of the kidney. Candidiasis can cause microabscesses in the kidney, can cause papillary necrosis, but it, um, and it can cause pyelonephritis, but a nephrotic syndrome is not a known complication of candidiasis. Um, renal vein thrombosis, this is a little bit more debatable, but usually is thought to be the consequence of hypercoagulability in the nephrotic syndrome and not as much the cause of the nephrotic syndrome. Um, and he also, uh, yeah, so that I think that would be less likely because it probably was the consequence. Um, so just to talk a little bit about secondary membranous, I mean, I think what a lot of us as nephrologists think about is cancers are always high on the list. NSAIDs and other drugs, lupus, hepatitis B and C, are things that are commonly thought of. Um, but I think the things that we at least think of a little bit less on our differential are, in fact, some other chronic infections. So schistosomiasis, syphilis, strongyloides, malaria, all of these have been associated at times with uh, member secondary membranous. Um, and disseminated strongyloides, which is something that I had never seen before this patient. We don't see it much in Boston, but apparently on occasion. Um, so it's often in a patient with chronic strongyloides infection who then becomes immune suppressed. Um, some of the more common symptoms are rashes, itching, GI distress, um, and worsening pulmonary function can be probably the most common organ to have a lot of problems with, but it really can disseminate to almost any organ. Um, and dissemination to the kidneys has been reported to cause minimal change disease or membranous nephropathy. Um, there have been some case reports of improvement in the kidney disease with ivermectin to treat the infection. Um, so just to show a little bit of the kidney histology here, so this is just showing membranous nephropathy. Um, 
And then in this patient, there were actually, when they did the autopsy, they did see these Strongyloides larvae in the glomeruli. Um, and this was in a paratubular capillary, another Strongyloides larva. Um, and I believe we saw it in the lungs as well. It was pretty much completely disseminated. Um, and similar to other patients with nephrotic syndromes, you're going to see subepithelial deposits of immune complexes in the setting of a chronic infection. So I think one of the reasons for, or the big reason for bringing up this case is not as much that any one of us are specifically going to see a whole lot of strongyloides associated membranous nephropathy, but, um, just that, you know, in this case, probably he was exposed back home um, when he was started on steroids for what very well might have been PMR or some other form of, uh, or some form of arthritis, then the parasites disseminated in the setting of the immune suppression. When the steroids were then increased, it worsened the infection as the nephrotic syndrome developed because of the infection. Um, so I think especially when we're working people up for transplant, it's really important to consider testing for endemic infections. So if you knew that somebody's from an area or has been recently to an area that they could be at risk for these chronic infections, it's really important to treat. Um, in this case, ivermectin might have been life-saving for him before he got as sick as he did. Um, so I think it's definitely something to think about um, before immune-suppressing patients, either for transplant, for other illnesses for cancers um, to just think about these infections. You know, I don't know offhand about leishmaniasis, but um, I don't know. I'd have to look that one up. I, had, I didn't see it when I looked through the reports, but it doesn't mean that there's not case reports of it. So I think I've seen like our transplant division will screen. I think you can see some of the larvae in the stool. Um, and I've seen it like our transplant division, at least I know, will do it if they see that somebody's from an area endemic for some sort of infection um, or has some sort of other exposure, then they will do whatever the appropriate screening is. Um, the other infections, I mean, my best guess is that he just was so sick between with the albumin level of 0 0.8, he just had absolutely no, and being immune suppressed at the same time on high dose steroids that he was just, um, I mean, we certainly know that people on steroids that are immune suppressed are at risk for candidal infections. Um, I don't know exactly where the aspergillus came from, but um, you know, the strong loides clearly was when we got the kidney biopsy back was the one that caused the kidney problems, but I think, um, that our presumption kind of as a team, and this was multiple, um, excuse me? I, HIV testing was negative. HIV was negative in him. It was tested, I think, back at the outside hospital with the initial membranous and then again at the Brigham. So, um, so this next case here is a 54-year-old male. This was in my outpatient clinic, actually, as opposed to the inpatient side. 54-year-old um, male with a history of hypertension and hypokalemia with potassiums as low as 2.8 for at least seven years by the time he came to my clinic. Um, he was noted to have a magnesium level of 1.1 with his primary care physician, and it had really never been checked prior. So then he was sent to clinic for evaluation and management. Um, his past history was pretty benign, hypertension, hypokalemia, GERD, and epicondylitis. Um, when he came into clinic, his uh, medications, he was on magnesium glucate, gluconate two grams three times a day, potassium chloride 60 a day, amlodipine 10, omeprazole 20, and spironolactone 12.5. Um, he was an ex-smoker. He drank two drinks per week, seemed to be pretty honest about that, married, worked full-time, um, and there was really no family history of this at all. Um, because of the potassium, someone had gotten 24-hour urine prior to him coming to see me, and the only thing that was notable on this 24-hour urine was his 24-hour urine calcium was quite low at 11. Um, but otherwise, it seems like he stuck to a fairly low-sodium diet, and everything else was fairly 
expected. His 24-hour creatinine of 1.4 was pretty consistent with his body habitus and muscle mass. Um, not very proteinuric. Um, but no one had tested the magnesium as part of this. Um, so when he came to see me and he was on you know, the two grams to, I guess, six grams a day of magnesium as well as the potassium, his mag level was 1.6, his potassium a 3.5, Bicarb of 25, phosphate 2.7, calcium 8.7, um, and this was with a normal albumin, so uh, corrected was also about 8.7, and creatinine of 0 0.8. His PTH was 31. Um, his TTKG was 9.7, so high in the setting of a low potassium. Um, his renin and aldosterone were undetectable, and a spot urine magnesium was also undetectable. So I think the question here is, what is the most likely reason for the hypomagnesemia and the hypokalemia? Is that his omeprazole? Does he have Gittleman syndrome? Does he have a renal tubular acidosis? Uh, is this due to the amlodipine? Or is this a diagnosis of Barter syndrome? All right. Okay, so it looks like most folks are thinking either the omeprazole or Gittleman's and a few for barters here. Um, the answer in this case was actually the omeprazole. Um, and the reason that the other ones were not, so Gittleman syndrome, I think, was the suspicion actually when he came to see me because of the low urine calcium and the low potassium and low magnesium, but in Gittleman syndrome, there should be magnesium wasting, and he really had no magnesium wasting because he had no magnesium in his urine at all, um, which pointed against Gittleman's. Um, a renal tubular acidosis would be unlikely. His serum bicarb was normal. Um, usually, magnesium is not extremely low in that case, although you can get low mag in the setting of low K, um, but it should be renally excreted then. Um, and it usually doesn't cause a severe hypomagnesemia. Um, amlodipine really isn't a cause of any of these findings. Um, barters, you would see a high urine calcium. Barters is more of the loop than the distal tubule. Um, and you would see a higher urine magnesium as well. Um, in most cases, except for some rare acquired cases, um, it really should uh, present in childhood and present quite severely. So it would be unusual for somebody in their 50s um, to be presenting for the first time with a barter syndrome. Um, so the whole idea of proton pump inhibitor induced hypomagnesemia um, came about in 2006. And I think, as we all know, there have been more and more things found with proton pump inhibitors as we use them chronically for more time. Um, but this was noted to be seen in patients with more than one year of proton pump inhibitor intake. So unlikely to be seen when you first start somebody on it. Their magnesium doesn't usually drop quickly. Um, seems to be related to any and all PPIs, so it's not just omeprazole. Um, does not seem to be dose-related. Um, it's also often associated with hypocalcemia and an inappropriately low PTH, and I'll go through some suspected mechanisms of that as well. Um, so this was the original New England Journal case report that presented this where they looked at magnesium and calcium trends on two patients. And what I'll point out, I realize it's kind of small, but um, up here is serum calcium and down below is serum magnesium. And um, this line right here, this black line, is the urinary magnesium. Um, here is where omeprazole was stopped. So the urine magnesium is extremely low here. Omeprazole is stopped, the serum magnesium level goes up, and the urine magnesium level shoots up from practically nothing um, to much higher. Um, so, and then they started the patient on esomeprazole, which is Nexium, goes back down, stop the esomeprazole, and it goes right back up. And a similar pattern down here where the omeprazole was stopped and the urine magnesium shoots up, the serum magnesium level goes back up. So looked fairly convincing at the time, at least, that it seemed to be very closely related to the PPI, and importantly, that it seemed like if you stopped the PPI, that the level would correct itself potentially pretty quickly. 
Um, so why does this happen? So the low magnesium levels in the urine suggest that it's due to a GI loss from poor absorption. Um, magnesium is absorbed actively and passively in the GI tract, and um, the fact that it can be even partially corrected by very high dose supplementation um, suggests that there's at least some passive transport there. Um, there are some theories in terms of a few transporters in the intestinal, in the small intestine that um, may be affecting this. I wasn't. Um, I can add them in, but I was not overly familiar with the intestinal uh, transporters, but it looks like more research into this has shown that some, some small intestinal transporters seem to be damaged or blocked in the setting of PPIs. Um, so the low potassium is really, I think as we all know, that whenever somebody has low potassium, we check the magnesium. So why are they so influenced by each other? So, and as we saw in this patient, it looked like he had a pretty significant amount of renal potassium wasting. Um, his aldosterone level was low, so it didn't seem like it was aldosterone-mediated potassium wasting. Um, so the thought is that normal magnesium levels inhibit this ROMK channel, the renal outer medullary potassium channel. This channel will secrete reabsorbed potassium into the thick ascending limb. Thick ascending limb. So um, if the low, if the serum magnesium levels are low, they'll increase potassium secretion because they kind of take away the inhibition of the secretion. So um, it's a little bit backwards, but basically, um, if, when the magnesium levels are low, um, they cause increased potassium secretion through the ROMK channels. Um, the low calcium and PTH, so low magnesium is also known to suppress parathyroid secretion. Um, and it's been shown in some cases that if you give parenteral magnesium, it'll actually raise parathyroid levels back up. So, and low magnesium also causes resistance of the bone to the parathyroid. Um, these are often seen with magnesium levels of less than one, but at times, by the time the patient got to me, his level was up to 1.6, but this was actually after quite a few IV and oral magnesium trials um, to get his level up, and it had been around one or 0.9 for a little bit. Um, and the thought is then that if the parathyroid level's low um, because of the suppression, that there's not as much calcium absorption and the calcium level is low. So um, this is supposedly what explains why in these cases the PTH and the calcium are low. Um, so classically in these patients, you'll see low magnesium, low potassium, low calcium, and low PTH. Um, and I should say just before this that I actually... Um, I realized I didn't put the follow-up on this slide, but we did take the patient off of his um, PPI, and he actually was able to come off quite a bit of his, uh, all of his magnesium supplementation, I believe. He did remain on a little bit of potassium supplementation, um, but he was able to be weaned off pretty much everything else, so it quite dramatically helped his magnesium and potassium levels. So this is the last full case I'll present. Um, then I have a short one in the end. Um, this is a 67-year-old female um, with a history of a GI stromal tumor who was status post imatinib treatment. Uh, she had a history of hypertension. She had a history of diabetes maintained on insulin. She was hospitalized to the oncology service for low back pain. Uh, she was taking a lot of naproxen at home, wasn't working, and came in. Her serum, serum sodium level went down, was down as low as 114, which is how the renal service got involved. Um, she was presumed to have SID, IADH due to the back pain and maybe some contribution of the NSAIDs um, causing hyponatremia. She was fluid restricted. Her NSAIDs were stopped. Her sodium went up to 124, and she was discharged with a sodium of 124. She was readmitted three weeks later for weakness, um, and when she was readmitted, her sodium was back down to 120, potassium of 2.9. Um, otherwise, um, oh, I just realized I put a bicarb of 87. That's not correct. Um, it was a normal bicarb, um, a normal BUN and creatinine. Her LFTs showed a low albumin and extremely high T-billy, um, ALT, AST, and ALKFAS, so her certainly some liver dysfunction there. Um, at that time, her blood pressure was 74 over 50, but did improve to 120 over 7, 
57 with IV fluids. Um, she had heart rate of 80, dry mucous membranes, no edema, basically otherwise a pretty normal exam, just looked dry. Um, her medications at the time, she was on famotidine, potassium, glargine insulin, multivitamins, Fosnac, um, Ursodiol, and oxycodone PRN. She had been taken off the naproxen and put on oxycodone. Um, so I'll point out here, so this is just kind of a timeline, that when her gist was diagnosed, her serum sodium was 137. Um, she was back after she stopped the imatinib. So this is April. And then in June, she went through a course of imatinib. Um, sodium was 130 at that time. And then outpatient, even before she was hospitalized, it was 126, but wasn't really picked up on. Um, this is the hospitalization for back pain, the fluid restriction, and then the current hospitalization. Um, her serum osmolality was normal. Um, potassium is a little bit on the low side of normal. Um, her urine sodiums here were 69 and 90, it was 97 in the setting of 114. Um, during this hospitalization, her sodium was 120 when she came in. The urine sodium was 146, but it was actually not checked till after a liter and a half of saline. So we don't know what it was when she first came in. And the urine osmol osmolality as well was after some normal saline. So the question here is, what is the reason for this patient's hyponatremia? Is it a combination of liver disease and dehydration affecting intravascular volume? Is it SIADH due to the oxycodone and the low back pain? Hyperglycemia causing sodium dilution? Pseudohyponatremia or primary polydipsia? All right, so we have a little bit of a mix here in terms of the liver disease, SIADH, or uh, pseudohyponatremia. Um, and I think the overall reason is was the pseudohyponatremia, which I'll go through, although there probably was in this variation a little bit of an effect of the liver and maybe some SIADH. We have no real proof of that, but um, she probably was a little dehydrated at times. Um, so the big key to this in terms of what it was is the fact that all three times it was checked, regardless of what was happening, she had a normal serum osmolality, osmolarity with a low serum sodium. And so it effectively makes the other causes a lot less likely. So when we see a low serum sodium, one of the first things to check is the serum osms to see if it's a pseudohyponatremia or true hyponatremia. Um, so volume depletion in liver disease, technically you should see a low urine sodium, although certainly that last admission when she came in and was hypotensive, we didn't check a urine sodium till after fluids, so we can't rule that out completely. Um, SIADH uh, should have a low serum osmolality. Hyperglycemia actually should have a high serum osmolality, so, um, and her blood sugar uh, was fairly normal when she came in, so it would be less likely. Um, and with primary polydipsia, you would think her urine osmolality would be lower. Um, so I wanted to talk a little about pseudohyponatremia because I think it's one of those things that does come up more as a board question than that we actually see it. This was one of the few times that I've seen it, I think. Um, and what it is is an artificially low plasma sodium um, with normal serum osmolarity. Um, some potential causes would be hyperlipidemia, hyperproteinemia, and the setting of um, certain types of cancers that um, secrete very high amounts of paraproteins, irrigation solutions like glycine and sorbitol, um, some procedures like a TERP hysteroscopy or laparoscopy with some of the fluids that they give that get absorbed. Um, so why does this happen? Um, so in normal, serum, in normal serum, and I'll show a picture of this in a second, um, it, there, it's about 93% water and 7% fat and proteins. Um, so sodium concentration and physi physiologically important serum water is 154, which is what something like normal saline would be. Um, and 93% of 154 is 142, which is about an average normal sodium. So you would measure a sodium of 142. 
in an abnormal serum where somebody has, say, just for an example, 20% fat and protein instead of 7%, you have the same sodium concentration in the water, but you're going to get, because the, so it's only 80% of the volume, you're going to get a um, reading of 123. And I'll show you how that happens. Um, so there's a few different ways to measure sodium, directly and indirectly. Um, the way it's mostly done in the labs is actually this indirect, poten indirect potentiometry. Um, and basically what it is is, so you can see, this is normal. So if you've got your 93% and your... Um, in here, so you start in both of these cases. This is the normal, this is the abnormal. Um, so in this case, you and both of them, you're gonna dilute it. When they do the assay, they dilute it and then do the measurements. So if you take this one, which is the normal one, and you dilute it, then you're gonna get a concentration. And then if you take this one, which looks like it's the same amount in a tube, because the lab does not know that it's an abnormal amount of water to solid, and then they dilute it, there's a lot less particles in there because there's a lot less here, and but they've diluted it the same amount, and then your effective concentration is gonna be a lot lower. Um, so how do we get around this? So basically by doing what's called direct potentiometry, where it measures the electrical potential across a sodium selective membrane in an unknown serum sample. So basically without dilution. Um, and the electrical potential is a function of the sodium activity in the sample. Um, it's applied to the undiluted sample. Um, and uh, there are ways to do it indirectly. I'm not sure I can explain that, but um, this is where like a blood gas, if you were to check, if you have a patient whose serum sodium comes back low and, you, um, and you're expecting it might be a pseudohyponatremia, then you can check a blood gas, which is actually measured directly, and you'll get a value of the true sodium level. So what happened in this patient? Um, so we did check her lipid panel as part of the workup of pseudohyponatremia and saw that she had extremely high lipid levels. So her total cholesterol was over 1,800, triglycerides almost 1,000, her direct LDL of 1,760. Um, a lipid electrophoresis was done, which showed, quote unquote, a band of unknown significance between LDL and VLDL, um, which was de defined as lipoprotein X. So what is lipoprotein X? Because I had never heard of it before I saw this case. Um, so it's a reflux of unesterified cholesterol and phospholipids into the circulation, usually in the setting of cholestasis, not soluble in water. So they do increase the solid fraction of the plasma, and they can cause laboratory abnormalities. Um, but they don't really seem to have pathologic consequences other than the laboratory abnormalities. Um, I mean, clearly her liver dysfunction probably is having pathologic con consequences, but the lipoprotein X itself does not have known consequences. Um, so in this patient, the presumption was that she got the imatinib, it caused cholestasis, which caused the lipoprotein X. The lipoprotein X caused um, the readings of her sodium to be low, and this generated this pseudohyponatremia. So just a real quick one in the end. So a, a final must-know zebra here, since this is a talk about zebras. Um, oops, I don't know. This, so the, hmm, ah, the question here, hold on, is which disease presents with these zebra bodies? Is it Fabry's disease, immune attactoid glomerulopathy, amyloidosis, Alport syndrome, or Balkan nephropathy? Good. So yeah, I think most people thought Fabry's disease here, which is absolutely correct. Um, and these are, this is kind of one of those bored zingers that you got where zebra bodies are associated with Fabry's disease. What are zebra bodies? Uh, lysosomes filled with trihexosilceramide uh, um, due to a defect in lysosomal alpha-galactosidase. So um, 
basically filling up in the kidneys. Um, some other Fabry's histology, vacuolated visceral epithelial cells, um, where you can see all these little vacuoles there. Um, and the vacuoles actually stain with toluidine blue. Um, so that's another kind of telltale sign of Fabry's in uh, histology, if you're shown that. 